Welcome back to another edition of the Pegcast. But before we get to the interview that I have for you guys today, let us go through scores of the day. These scores are from today's date, which is October 3rd, 2020. So the NBA kicked off their M- kicked off the finals, which is between the Miami Heat and the LA Lakers. The LA Lakers take a key game to win against the Heat, 124-114, to go up 2-0 in the series. Miami has to rebound, that's a pun intended, for this Game 3 that is upcoming. This is a huge, pivotal Game 3 in the series. I don't know if Miami can really come back down 3-0. This seems to be at least, you know, one of the least competitive finals in recent memory. Let's be honest here. Moving on into the MLB, the Miami Marlins pull off the shock against the Chicago Cubs, winning the best of three series to nothing. Miami is still undefeated in postseason play as they have won seven straight playoff series. In 1997, they played three series and evidently won the World Series. And the same thing happened in 2003. The San Diego Padres used a full bullpen day to capture the Game 3 series victory against the St. Louis Cardinals of a score 4-0 after that crazy Game 2 that was 9-8 for the Padres. Both ALDS series start on Monday, October 5th with the Houston Asterix, sorry Astros, and the Oakland Athletics kicking things off at 4.07 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And also in the MLB, they are selling 11,500 tickets for the NLCS in the World Series, which is the first step to having fans back in the building. Let's hope that, you know, the MLB does it in the safest way possible. Let's transition on into the NHL. As we know, the Tampa Bay Lightning defeated the Dallas Stars in six games to win the Stanley Cup. Now we are transitioning into the offseason, and already there has been some pretty big news. The Vegas Golden Knights signed Robin Leonard to a five-year, $25 million deal. I think it's a great signing, and Leonard finally gets a home after being on the road and switching teams so often the last few seasons. And I think he actually deserves uh, the contract, uh, you know, getting uh, five years at $25 million. He deserves it for how well he's recently played. More news, Arizona Coyotes put Michael Grabner on waivers for the purpose of a buyout. You know, this does kind of come as a surprise to me, but not really in a sense. Uh, You know, the guy will find work quite soon. You know, you could put Michael Grabner on the bottom six. Great role player. Great guy for the penalty kill. Huge defensive player, in my opinion. And GMGR makes a good move. Well, it is 2020 after all. Weird things continue to happen. He signed Tristan Jari to a team-friendly deal three years at three and a half mil per this must mean that Murray must be out of way, uh, you know, coming out of, um, This must mean that Matt Murray must be on his way out of town. You know, fans can't really get mad at what Murray gave the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, you know, he obviously gave them the cup uh, back in, what is it, against the San Jose Sharks. Uh, so, you know, God be happy for Murray. And hopefully uh, Murray kind of rebounds from his past couple of seasons. Montreal is open to trading the number 16 overall pick for a top six scoring forward, which is once again one of their offseason needs. You know, the top six scoring forward doesn't really come as a surprise as Montreal has been drafting forwards kind of late. They did draft a lot of defensemen last year, but let's hope that uh, Bergevin finds what he needs. Devin Dubnik seems to be on his way to San Jose, which kind of confuses me in a way because now San Jose would have one of the worst goalie tandems in the NHL with how badly Jones has been playing. Plus, no one is going to take on that Martin Jones contract. Vancouver and Boston are both in on Oliver ekman Larson. It wouldn't be a surprise to me to see Vancouver lose to Boston once again and inevitably burn down the city. I mean, that story's already been written before. It'll probably be written again. Moving on into the NFL, Miami, the Miami Dolphins defeated the Jacksonville Jaguars 31-13. Both teams are now 1-2 and two on the season. Ryan Fitzpatrick had 160 yards passing, 18 for 20, two touchdowns. Miles Gaskin rushed for 66 yards on 22 carries. Devontae Parker had 69 yards with five receptions. You know, who really planned these primetime games? I'll be honest, because there's no way in the preseason, you know, as I was looking at the schedule that I was so hyped up for a Jacksonville and Miami Dolphins primetime game. And another question I got is, when does Tua Tagovailoa get that start, that elusive start that all Dolphin fans have been waiting for? 
Hopefully it is soon. The Atlanta Falcons choke another lead. Are we surprised at that at all? Let's be real, I don't think I am. This time it is to the Chicago Bears that Chicago comes down in the second half starting Nick Foles. Well, it does do wonders when you don't play Mitch Trubisky. The Bears ride a strong fourth quarter scoring 20 points. Nick Foles finished with 188 yards passing, 16 for 29, 3 touchdowns and 1 interception. David Montgomery rushed for 45 yards on 14 carries. Allen Robinson had 123 yards receiving with 10 catches and a touchdown. Atlanta is still winless on the season and still continue to blow leads. Chicago improves to 3-0. The Buffalo Bills nearly become the Atlanta Falcons, choking a 28-3 lead against the LA Rams as they survive the late surge and win on a game-winning drive of a score 35-32. Josh Allen has his third straight 300-yard-plus passing game, 24 for 33, four touchdowns, one interception. Devin Singletary, 71 yards rushing on 13 carries. Cole Beasley had 100 yards on six receptions. Buffalo improves to 3-0. LA falls to 2-1. Cleveland Browns win against the Washington football team, 34-20. Baker Mayfield had 156 yards passing, 16 for 23, with two touchdowns. Nick Chubb rushed for 108 yards on 19 carries with two touchdowns. Odell Beckham Jr. had 59 yards on four receptions. Cleveland improves to two and one. Washington falls to two and Washington falls to one and two. The Tennessee Titans win on you know Stephen Goskowski's leg as Stephen had six field goals. To beat the Minnesota Vikings 31-30, Ryan Tannehill has been superb since taking over for Marcus Mariota late last season. He finished the game with 321 yards passing, 23 for 37 with an interception. Derrick Henry rushed for 119 yards on 26 carries and 2 TDs. That guy is a beast. And Khalif Raymond had 118 yards on 3 receptions. Tennessee is unbeaten at 3-0 and Minnesota is winless at 0-3. England continues to roll as they win against the Las Vegas Raiders 36-20. Cam Newton had 162 yards passing, 17 for 28, with a touchdown and an interception. Sonny Michelle had 117 yards on uh, rushing on 19 on nine carries. Rex Burkhead led all Pats receivers with 49 yards on seven catches and a touchdown. Quite impressive since a running back led the team in passing or in receiving. Both teams are two and one on the young season. The San Francisco 49ers C team slaughtered the New York Giants 36-9. Nick Mullins had 343 yards passing, 20, 25 for 36 with a touchdown. Jarek McKinnon rushed for 38 yards on 14 carries and a touchdown. Brandon Ayuk, rookie out of ASU, forks up, had 70, had 70 yards on 5 catches. San Fran improved to 2-1 despite the amount of injuries they are suffering this year. The Giants are winless uh, at 0-3, despite being probably the better team on paper in this match. The Cincinnati Bengals and Philadelphia Eagles tie. 23-23. Carson Wentz had 225 yards, 29 for 47, with a touchdown and an interception. Miles Sanders rushed for 95 yards on 18, ca on 18 carries. Greg Ward had 72 yards on 8 receptions and a touchdown. Joe Burrow, who's a rookie out of LSU, passed for 312 yards, 31 for 44 with 2 touchdowns. Joe Mixon rushed for 49 yards on 17 carries. Tyler Boyd had 125 yards on 10 catches. Both teams are 0-2-1. The Pittsburgh Steelers used a strong second half, scoring 11 points in that second half, as they used that to beat the Houston Texans 28-21. Ben Roethlisberger passed for 237 yards, 23 for 36, two touchdowns. James Conner rushed for 109 yards, 18, 18 carries, and a touchdown. Eric Ebron had 52 yards on five receptions and a touchdown. Houston is winless at 0-3, and the Steelers are undefeated at 3-0. The Indianapolis Colts crushed the New York Jets 36-7. The only points of the Jets came in the first quarter. They were held pointless for three quarters of the game. Good job, Gase, you idiotic piece of garbage. Phillip Rivers passed for 217 yards, finished the game with 17 for 21, and a touchdown. Jonathan Taylor, who is a rookie out of Wisconsin-Madison, rushed for 59 yards on 13 carries and had a touchdown. 
T.Y. Hilton had 52 yards receiving on three catches. The New York Jets remained winless at 0-4, and, and the Colts improved to 2-1. and The Carolina Panthers beat the L.A. Chargers 21-16. Teddy Bridgewater had 235 yards passing, 22 for 28, and a touchdown. Mike Davis rushed for 46 yards on 13 carries. D.J. Moore had 65 yards, 65 receiving yards on two receptions. Both teams are 1-2 on the season, and I gotta say, Justin Herbert has really impressed me with his play, but this was the game where his mistakes were exposed as a rookie, and you know, that's gonna happen. Let's see how he's gonna rebound with this upcoming week. The Detroit Lions hold on to beat the Arizona Cardinals 26-23. Matthew Stafford passes for 270 yards, 22 for 31, and two touchdowns. Adrian Pearson, yep, he's still kicking around, rushed for 75 yards on 22 carries. Kenny Galladay, one of the better underrated wide receivers in the league, had 57 yards on 6 receptions and a touchdown. The Lions get their first win of the season, making them 1-2 on the season. This win actually snapped an 11-game losing streak against the Cardinals. The you know Arizona loses their first game, which makes them 2-1 on the season. Tampa Bay played, played around with the Denver Broncos like playing with your younger brother, beating them 28-10. The Broncos are also heavily injured, which kind of factored into the result. Tom Brady had 297 yards, 25 for 38 with three touchdowns. Ronald Jones II rushed for 53 yards on 13 carries. Scotty Miller had 83 yards on three receptions. Tampa is 2-1 now on the season, and the Broncos are 1-3. The Seattle Seahawks win a thriller of a game 38-31 against the Dallas Cowboys. Russell Wilson throws for 315 yards. 27 for 40, and 5 touchdowns. Chris Carson rushed for 64 yards on 14 carries. DK Metcalf, rookie out of Ole Miss. And uh, my God, is he ever ripped. I mean, we all seen that meme, right? Or is that just me? I mean, wow. Uh, you know, he had 110 yards on 4 catches and a touchdown, but he could have had 2 touchdowns had he not showboat on Trevon Diggs, the rookie out of Alabama, who knocked the ball out of his hand, which was then ruled a touchback. Seattle remains undefeated, 3-0, and the Cowboys dropped at 1-2 on the season. The Green Bay Packers win a great game against the New Orleans Saints, 37-30. Aaron Rodgers throws for 283 yards, 21 for 32, with 3 touchdowns. Aaron Jones rushed for 69 yards on 16 carries and a touchdown. Alan Lazard had 146 yards receiving on 6 receptions and a touchdown. The Chiefs' heads remain undefeated at 3-0. And the Saints dropped to 1-2 on the season. I thought this matchup was great because everyone loves a matchup between two future Hall of Famers. Which kind of leads into the Monday Nighter. But this was supposed to be a good game, goddammit. At least it was for one side. The Kansas City Chiefs and Baltimore Ravens. Both possessing two of the brightest teams in the NFL. I mean, you, you know, the quarterback's headline. Patrick Mahomes. Lamar Jackson. Kansas City ended up on top 34-20. Patrick Mahomes had 385 yards, 31 for 42 with 4 touchdowns. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, rookie out of LSU, had 64 yards rushing on 20 carries. Travis Kelsey had 87 yards receiving on 6 receptions. The Chiefs remained undefeated at 3-0 and the Ravens dropped to 2-1. Well folks, enjoy your Sunday. And let's throw it to the interview with Iowa Wild defenseman Matt Register. Thank you again everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the PegCast. I'm your host, Michael Pagani, joined alongside Iowa Wild defenseman Matt Register. Matt, how are you today? Oh, I'm wonderful, man. It's Friday, you know, it's the sun's out and uh, can't complain. Yeah, so. I mean, uh, sun's out here as well where I am, uh, situated. Beautiful day out. Uh, I'm not too uh, big of a fan with the hot weather. I'm more of a winter guy, but I'll take it. Yeah, absolutely, right? You know, it's... Uh... You know, winter's obviously a good year, hockey season, but, uh, you know, right now uh, it is what it is, and we'll, we'll take it. Now, lots of people have been watching Tiger King, Ozark, and Outer Banks or other hit shows. Uh, what have you been doing during quarantine? Oh, geez. I mean, I've seen probably every single Netflix show there is out there. Um, I'm big into billions on, on Showtime. Um, I've seen Outer Banks. I've seen Tiger King. I've seen uh, – Space Force that just came out. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, I honestly, there's people ask me for recommendations and I can just go all day long with recommendations. But, uh, I mean, I've 
literally you could ask me a show and I, I probably could tell you I've seen it. Now, Tiger King took the media world by storm since it was probably the first uh, show released since quarantine hit. What were your thoughts on it? It was, uh, it was different for sure. I mean, I didn't watch it. I saw a lot of hype on it um, when it first came out, and I probably took about maybe a week or two later after it came out to watch it. I mean, I read all the hype and, and stuff, but um, – it's uh it was kind of crazy it took a turn at the end with uh you know I, I honestly I think this Carol Baskin is uh you know somebody's got to dig some dirt up on her because I think she might be guilty in that department but uh I mean that that Joe Exotic guy was kind of weird himself I mean you know it's you know it's a it's a show it's a it's a reality show I mean it's people make money on it but it's uh you know it was it was very interesting I mean I, I enjoyed it um every step of the way so I'm not sure if you heard, but recently uh, news came out that Carol Baskins actually owns uh, Joe Exotic Zoo. I seen that. Yeah, I actually seen that on Twitter, and yeah, I don't even honestly this is <laughs> and everything. I don't even know what to believe anymore. I mean, I just watched the show, and 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 you know, people ask me about it, I just kind of give my opinion, and and that's that. But you know what? Like nowadays, well, well, what do you believe, really? Right? Joe Exotic is just one freak of nature, man. Oh, he's yeah, he yeah I don't even know how to describe him if you were to ask me how to describe him like three words I wouldn't even know how to describe that guy I mean he's he's an absolute character but like I said it it was reality tv and it and it it got every every hour out of me to watch it and I mean it was um it was enjoyable besides Netflix shows have you ever watched NASCAR or Bundesliga ever since it's returned no I haven't no I, I I have not at all no I'm not. Uh, I'm not really familiar with it, to be honest. Well, I just thought because you know, with no sports on, like the casual sports fan might flip it on just to see something, man. Because I know we're all dying for you know to indulge in these sports. Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, honestly, I haven't at all. Not on my end, no. I mean, I've just kind of been too busy with kind of filling my days with a lot of Netflix, and since golf's back, been out playing golf every day, and yeah, just trying to fill my day with whatever I can. With golf being back, how busy are the tee times? They're pretty busy. I mean, I try to make a tee time almost every day, and then I just kind of play it by year just so I have a slot. But, um, you know, a lot of the guys around Minnesota here, uh, they came back here throughout this this time since we've been off in March. And, um, uh, I mean, there's really, you know, you're, you're outside, you're not – you're not really in a public place, you know, you are at a public place, but you're outside and you're, you're kind of keeping your distance and stuff. And it's kind of the only thing to do really. I mean, you know, and then you get together with the guys and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, catch up and, and see where everyone's at. So it's, it's, it's been pretty fun, you know, to see a lot of the guys that I played with in Iowa this year that are residents here in Minnesota. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been better than it was when it first started in this whole quarantine in March. Now, with the last dance, I'm, uh, I'm sure you've probably seen that. Uh, Michael Jordan always bet on himself uh, with the golf. Do you ever do the same? Well, we try to have, you know, we try to make it interesting out there. I mean, we don't uh, we don't got the 250 grand like Michael Jordan is playing for the 18th hole. The 18th holes were 250 grand is what I've heard a couple stories on, on him. But uh, uh, he's uh, – He's very unique. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories. I've played with some guys, play golf, that's uh, members in country clubs that he's at down in Florida and, and, and around the U.S. And and some of the stories he has is, uh, you know, that's, it's very interesting. I mean, I would love to play one round of golf with that guy one, one day, but uh, it'll never happen. But, you know, it's uh, – he's just uh, – he's an outstanding character, that guy. I mean, he's done everything there is to do. Growing up in Calgary, uh, I would assume that you sided with the Flames rather than the Oilers. I do, yeah. I was actually born in Winnipeg, so uh, you know, kind of an early Jet fan there. You know, in Timo Solani days and uh, you know Keith Kachuk and stuff. But uh, um, definitely, uh, you go out there. There's a lot of hype on the Flames. You know, people love the love can like not necessarily love the flames but in general in Canada people love hockey and and you know the hockey man Canada's on Saturday nights and and the double headers but um you can never go wrong with any of those Canadian teams that's for sure did you ever go to the saddle dome to see a game yeah actually I went to the uh I was at the 04 flames Tampa Bay lightning finals when 
they thought they scored in overtime. It got disallowed. And then I think it was, was it might have been Dave Anderchuk came back and scored the winner or something that day. And it was, uh, and then the Tampa went on to win the Stanley Cup that year, a little bit devastating for the city of Calgary. And then, um, you know, kind of <laughs> haven't had that success to get back there yet. But uh, been to quite a few games. Yeah, down there. It's, uh, it's fun. They shut down uh, downtown a little bit. They got the, they got a Calgary Flames bar and they, um, they, uh, they get going down there. It's, it's a lot of fun. Well, I did visit Calgary, I believe, uh, past, uh, this past summer, uh, and I did get to the opportunity to tour the Saddle Dome. Did you ever experience it? Yeah. No, it's, um, it's, uh, it's pretty – it's it, it's fun. It's a little bit older of a building, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's nice. I mean, you know, you know, you got an NHL team playing out of there, and, you know, they're going to take care of you from top to bottom. And I, I actually think they're – I don't know if they did get approved yet for a new building in Calgary or not. Uh, I think they might have. I think they did as well. But now the Saddle Dome is um it's pretty historic. It is. It's it it is it is an historical building. I mean it's um you know there's a lot has happened there and it's you know it's you you're right in the mix downtown Calgary and it's it's a beautiful spot. Now, uh, obviously the building got flooded. Where were you when you heard that news? I was actually in where was I playing? I, I think I was away playing hockey. Um, how many years ago? What was that? Was that last year, two years ago? Uh, that the South Dome got flooded? Yeah. No, I believe that was about maybe five, six years ago. Was it five, six years ago? I might have been. Yeah, it seems like a whole other universe. Yeah, it just feels like it was not too long ago. But, you know, I was away playing hockey somewhere, and I I, I was reading all the damages and, and how bad it got flooded. And, you know, they recovered nicely from it, but um, they're definitely due for a new building, which will be nice to see for the city of Calgary. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's get into your uh, journey here. Uh, who influenced you to start hockey? Well, I my dad played a little bit growing up. So, you know, ever since I really started walking, threw on a pair of skates and kind of didn't look back for me. It was kind of um, all the way through. I, I mean, I I tried a few other sports, not really anything competitive, to be honest. I mean, you know, the, the, the fun soccer leagues and, um, you know, kind of played a little little baseball, no football, but kind of explored a little bit. But hockey's been um, kind of my day one and just didn't look back, and I've always had a love for it. Now, with your – like you said, your dad was probably one of the biggest influencers in your life. Did he – because you said he played a bit. Uh, what was his, you know, highest level he played? He played – he only played junior hockey. That was it. Um, you know, he kind of bounced around a little bit. Uh, my grandma and grandpa being – my grandpa being in the Air Force. So, um, you know, hard to settle down with some roots. But, um, you know, him and his brothers were always big hockey guys and, and, and loved it even though, I mean, they didn't really go far. And um, even if it was just putting a pair of skates on and getting the outdoor rink and that was all they needed. So, um, you know, I, I – I love those stories coming from my dad and it's just been um, it's been something me and him share very closely together. I mean, he loves watching me play hockey and coming down and seeing me and, and um, you know, I'm never too old to get advice from your dad about, you know, playing hockey or what you're doing. And um, you know, those are the things that uh, we connect on, on a, uh, on a very serious note. And it's um, something I'll always cherish with him. Now, as we're growing up, we often idolize an NHL player. Did you ever idolize anyone? You know what? My go-to guy when I started playing junior and stuff was Chris Pronger. Oh, big guy. Uh, yeah, I loved him. I mean, um, I didn't really get the whole I, – I, I mean, I tried to play a little mean at the first start of my career, but, um, you know, he's, he's a big guy. You know, he's a decent skater, great shot, hard shot, getting pucks in the net, little things, good passer. I mean, he's – um, he's one guy I idolized and watched a lot of, and I, I, I still do. I mean, I, you know, follow him along now and, and, you know, he's always kind of in the community and, and, and got a lot of wise things to say to young players. And, um, he's always been someone I've really, um, I've really focused in on and keyed on because, and I honestly tried to roll my game a little bit around him because he kind of, um, had the same abilities I did and still kind of do. With him playing for the Flyers, did you ever, I guess, side with the Flyers? No, I really liked him when he played in a uh, little bit in Edmonton, to be honest. And uh, Anaheim, he was good there. Um, the Flyers, 
not, not so much, but it was still Chris Ponger and he was the guy to watch and, you know, you know, in, the, in those days and he was one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League then. And, um, you know, no matter what team really, I, it, those guys play on, you know, you idolize a player like that and you're always going to love them and, and, and think highly of them and, and, and want to watch them, want to be them when you grow up. Could you speak about uh, the road where you took to where you are today? Yeah, so a um, bit of a long road, actually. Um, started playing junior hockey in a small town, the Alberta Junior Hockey League. Um, bit of a slow start for me. Um, up until my 20-year-old year where I really started to have some, some success, uh, being named Defenseman of the Year in the Alberta Junior Hockey League, and and um, actually getting a full-ride scholarship to play at the University of Alabama Huntsville, but kind of last minute it uh, – kind of fell through a little bit which is you know it's it happened so um ended up uh taking me into a little bit of Canadian University where I mean I had to I already sign my U.S. letter of national intent so took me in a little bit of Canadian University which kind of you know they sighed a little bit of okay you sign your U.S. letter of intent but you want to come back and play in Canada so I kind of had to you know redshirt a little bit and catch up and stuff so and I was taking classes when I was um, playing junior hockey too as as well to kind of, you know, kind of get ahead of the game a little bit Why you know, you're not really, I'm not really doing a whole lot when you're 18, 19, you're just kind of practicing and playing. So I took a few classes and then, um, went to Canadian college for a little bit. And then, um, I got, I was a late bloomer. I got an opportunity to play in the central hockey league. Um, oh, well, this was oh, eight, wow, eight years ago now played in central hockey league. Um, my first year in the Central Hockey League, I I played 22 games and I didn't get onto the playoff rosters. You know, a little bit disappointing. And kind of into the next season, I was like, "Well, what do I, what do I, what do I want to do?" And so I signed back in the Central Hockey League and um, got got waived. Um, you know, it was disappointing again. Got picked up. Um, got waived again. So it was uh, a little bit disappointing for me, whether it was, well, do I, do I grind this out or do I quit? What do I do? But, um, I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to play for the Ontario Reign in the East Coast Hockey League and finish off that year. And, and just, uh, absolute tremendous opportunity for me. I mean, coach brought me in and gave me every single opportunity to succeed. And, and, and the guys were fantastic when I came in and accepted me right in with only 13 games left in the year. And, um, you know, I came in and I made most of that opportunity and said, you know what, I'm just going to go and play. I'm not going to worry about anything else. And, uh, you know, I, I, I finished off really well. I mean, I was happy going in the summer. I was feeling good and they wanted me back. So it was a no brainer for me to go back in Ontario. And, you know, I, I got the same sort of, um, you know, leeway where I was able to do, you know, whatever I wanted. And, and as long as I was coming and showing up to play and it was, um, it was great for me. I mean, I just continued to develop and listening to the development staff in, in Ontario. When we had LA, we had Winnipeg as part of that affiliation. Um, you know, worked a lot of, with, with the development development staff and just kind of tweaked my game a little bit. And um, every day we just wanted to get better at, at at least one thing. And I did. And, you know, I kept, I put multiple years together where I started having some great success being named defenseman of the year in the East Coast Hockey League, which is, tremendous opportunity and I just I just kept going with it and I mean I just kept working hard and, and hard and ended up uh you know making the American Hockey League one year with Chicago Wolves playing some games that year um and um just kind of didn't look back and I kept going and, and and I ended up uh um coming into a situation in Colorado where um two young coaches just you know, gave me the opportunity and, and I ran with it. And it was, you know, coming in and being an older guy and leading the team and said, hey, we're going to win a championship here. And coming in the first year and we had just the best group of guys in Colorado, um, you know, no matter what kind of player you were, what kind of contract you were on, we all bought in and we won a championship in Colorado. And then next year, same thing, you know, we all bought in, you know, great, great, great leadership staff. Um, the staff in Colorado and, and pretty much every organization I've played in has been, you know, first class organizations. I have nothing bad to say about anybody in any organization and my teammates. It's been just outstanding and long term relationships and then ended up winning back to back championships in Colorado. And then um, you know, I 
first one I won was in Allen though. Um, went to Allen on a trade deadline. Um, you know what, that one's, it's, it's always fun to win a championship, but you know what, you're getting traded there at the deadline. How much contribution do you have at the deadline? What are you doing to win this kind of thing? Right. You know, you have your, your core group, you had a couple guys to come in and you know what, I got a great relationship with Steve Martinson as well. And, and, and Allen Americans have always been, um, it's always something I see I'm coming back to because it's where I started out playing pro um, in the Central Hockey League. And and, um, and then I go to Toledo. I mean, it's we reached the Kelly Cup Finals again. I mean, good group of older leadership guys. And, and, and that's the thing at those levels. You need a good three, four, five older leadership guys who are really committed to winning. And, and, and that's, you know, nobody wants to finish. And April first week in April and then you got a whole summer right so you know we 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 make Kelly Cup finals you know disappointing but you know we made the finals you know you come in second place which is still still good but you know who who really knows who came in second they always know who won the championship that year right so and then come back again to Allen I mean Steve Martinson gives me another opportunity and and says hey Iowa likes you you know, you live in Minnesota, these guys see you skate in the summer. Well, here's an opportunity for you. Let's see what you can do. And I went in Iowa and um, from day one, I just put my head to the grindstone and, and, and just wanted to come in and be a great player. Not only a great player, but team guy off the ice, you know, older guy at 30 come in and, 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 and really do whatever I was asked at that level. I mean, you're playing the American Hockey League, you know, sometimes you're not going to be able to play to your strengths. Sometimes you're going to have to do the opposite and, and, and adjust to it. And, um, and then I play full time or a full year in the American hockey league this year at 30 years old. And that's kind of, uh, you know, a story for me, it's, you know, not a lot of guys are coming in at 30 and going to get a one way American hockey league deal and play the full year in the AHL. And after grinding out for that long, you know, a lot of guys quit and retire and don't want to do it. And I just, hockey's always been day one for me. And, and, I'm very fortunate enough to play this game and I'm blessed to play this game. And for all the opportunities and relationships and people I've met, it's, it's been a long road. And um, for me, I got a lot of miles left in the tank to play. So. What caused you to keep going? Cause you said you got waved twice. So what influenced you to keep having that determination factor? You know what? A lot of people did tell me, well, are you good enough? Are you going to be good enough to play? Exactly, are you yeah. good enough player? Can you skate at that level? Can you play? And I just, wanted to prove a lot of people wrong in my heart just felt for me I just said you know what I'm gonna do this I'm not I I don't know how long it's gonna take but I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this for me and and my mom and dad have always believed in me and 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 gave me everything to succeed and and um kind of moving up the up the ladder that way and 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 having a pretty long career as it is I mean I I mean I'm still gonna play for a while but um you know what for them and just come into the rink and see me play now and seeing that smile on my dad's face and and mom's face and, you know, get to come out and see them after and say, Hey, great game. You know, you know, it's, that's just, um, holds a lot in my heart. It just, um, you know, I, I never, you know, I'm, who knows? I might, I'll probably never going to play in the national hockey league, but, um, for me to say, I made the American hockey league, you know, it's, it's, that's, how many people can say that really? I mean, it's just, um, um, you know, it's, you know, obviously playing the national hockey league is a dream come true, but you know what the American hockey league and, and the friendships I've made and the people I've met and staff and coaches and organizations I've been a part of it's um, I always remember. So um, yeah, just wanted to prove a lot of people wrong in that sense that, Hey, if you work hard enough, you can make it to where you want to be. Now, I don't want to put uh, salt in the wound here, but like you just said, you may never get the shot to play in the NHL. With you going undrafted, did that any did that add to the motivation of you wanting to prove everyone wrong? It did for sure. I mean, you know, eighteen, you you, you got to be you, you got to be a great hockey player to to get drafted at eighteen years old. You got to be either playing you, you got to be playing tier one junior hockey in the Western Hockey League or OHL or you know, kind of wherever you're playing. You know, those kids and you know, you get a couple you get a handful of guys from tier two junior a that are getting drafted in the national hockey league. And, um, for me, it was just, um, what do I want to do with my life? You know, what do I want to do? Do I want to try and play hockey for as long as I can and, 
and then figure it out after? Or do I just want to play junior hockey, go to college, play four years of college, and then start getting in the real world and work a job? You know, it was – me it was it was always i want to play hockey and it was um um so yeah i mean it was just it was just i wanted to play hockey from day one and that was my focus um and i was going to do everything i could to to play hockey at the professional level with you saying about the east coast and how you built so much so many relationships uh you played there uh, for you know the chunk of your career you amassed uh, 65 points in 72 games in 2017-18 which is your career high, what contributes to your success? You know what? It, it's a matter of kind of, well, you know, you're, you're going to get that opportunity, whether, okay, if you make the most of it, then and they're going to have trust in you. They're going to believe in you. They're going to throw you out to make that big play, make that big stop block, whatever it is. Um, and that's kind of what I did in, um, in Colorado. I mean, Eric, Schneekloff, he knew a lot about me. I think I played against him one year when he played in the Central Hockey League right before he retired too. And um, he just he just knew what kind of guy I was. And and I was I was all heart. I wanted to win every night. I don't care, you know, what what happened. We I wanted to play, I was gonna play till the buzzer. And I mean, you know, my my contributions that year, it was honestly pretty simple. I mean, you know, we had a lot of great players. I mean, getting pucks to the net was key that year. Um, letting guys go to work down in the crease area. And I got guys coming in from the flank areas to bang pucks home. And it was, um, you don't have those opportunities unless everybody buys in. And like I said, we had guys on NHL deals, AHL deals, ECHL deals, everybody, nobody thought they were better than one another and everybody contributed and, and, and did what they were told. And that's kind of at the end of the day, what, um, what you want, you know, individual success is great, but you know, championships are even better, right? As you, you come all together and you win a championship in June and it, it, there's no better feeling really, right? So you're not doing that without, you know, those guys you're playing with every day and you're coming to the rink with and going to battle with. And you know what? I, I've i had a lot of su success point-wise and, and, and I really, I wanted to work on a lot of things besides the point side. I, a plus minus is a huge category for me that I take a lot of pride in. And you know, kind of being that two-way guy and, and reliable guy that not only do I get put out with about a minute left in the game if we're down by a goal, but I want to get put out with a minute if we're up by a goal to, to, to be that guy and, and, and be that two-way guy, make a block, make a, make a play, chip a puck out, whatever it may be. And it's just um, – those statistics are it's, – it's statistics, right? I mean, it's just um, – you don't have that, that, those statistics if you don't have guys around you that want to make you better and, and believe in you also. You played in four straight ECHL playoffs. Uh, tell me about that experience. You know what? It's a pretty big honor to be the all-time ECHL playoff uh, um, games played. Um, you know, it's a pretty big honor, to be honest. And um, you know what? Like I said, in the ECHL, those, the, those leagues are tough because, you know, you finish in April. You're not making the money in the Amer like the American Hockey League and NHL, so guys got to go and maybe get a second job or, you know, whatever you may do. but you know what, that's where you really kind of rally and come together and, 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 and playoffs, it's the best time of year. You're playing the regular season to make the playoffs and then it's a whole new season, right? So, you know, it's, it was a long four years for me, to be honest. I mean, you know, playing until mid-June and then trying to take a little time off and then right, as you know, you're back in the mix in September. And, um, but you know what, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, those experiences I'll cherish and, and remember for all my life and, and the ECHL is tough too, because it's all seven game series. Um, the American hockey league's five in the first round. And so seven, it's seven. all, yeah, it's all, it's all, it, it's all a battle. I mean, and, and, and the travel in the ECHL too is not, you're not flying private. You're not doing these kind of things. You know, you're, you know, you're playing back to back. So you're jumping on a bus, you're going somewhere, you're playing in, in 48 hours, you know, it's tough on your body and it's, but you know what, that's, that's when it all comes together. And it's a lot of fun. And, 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 that's where you remember it the most. You won the Kelly Cup three years in a row, one of which was an Allen Cup, I should mention. Uh, take me through your emotions when you won it. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, you know, winning a championship, my first one in Allen, it's, it's your first one. You, you really, you're, 
you don't know what to believe. You I mean you win a championship and, and you're just kind of in, in wow and shock. And it was, um, it was awesome. I mean, those guys, great group of guys in Allen, we had a blast, you know, we, we dug in and, 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 and did it. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's a championship. I mean, it's how many guys can say they won a championship. I mean, I'll remember it forever. And like I said, coming over the deadline, it was, you know, it was a little harder for me to adjust, but you know what, it's, it's what you got to do. It's what I get paid to do. So I came over and we won a championship and it was, you know, best feeling, best feeling. Next year, I come into Colorado and right from the beginning, I say, Hey, coaches, players, we're going to win a championship. We're going to do it. And that year I come in and, you know, I, I'm first team all-star. I'm defenseman of the year. I'm leading the league in, in points. It's D man. I'm doing everything I can. And, um, you know what, I'll remember those, but at the end of the day, Colorado, and I was playoff MVP that year, my, my first year in Colorado, where it was, I think I'm maybe the first ever D man to win a playoff MVP in the ECHL. And I, honestly, that is by far my best memory, best year. Um, I'll take into my heart and, and throughout my, the rest of my career and, you know, telling my children and living on it forever. I mean, it's just, um, there's no words to describe it, how, how much it means to me. It was just from the get go from day one in Colorado. And we do that as, as a whole, it was just the best feeling in the whole entire world. And then the next year we, we do it again with a lot of the same guys and to win a championship back to back with almost half the team, it was pretty unforgettable experience. And with the coaching staff and, and winning one right before they get turned over to the American Hockey League is pretty special. I mean, it, it, it helps you win a championship. It always helps guys career moving forward and getting new contracts. And um, so it was just the experiences and, you know, the, the relationships on winning championships with guys are more, are stronger than, stronger than ever. And it's just, um, you know what, it's, it's, it's the best feeling. And not many people say they can win a championship, but winning three championships in a row is something pretty special to remember. So. Like you said, you were leading the league in points and, uh, you know, have, having such an amazing career. Did you ever have to uh, go to a chiropractor to check your back to make sure that you weren't carrying the team? Oh, man, I just, uh, you know what, some days it feels good to, you know, carry, the, carry it on your back a little bit. But you know what, every night somebody was doing something different and, 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 and helping the team and, and carrying the boys over that hump, you know. You know, I've scored a lot of big goals in those playoff series and, and, and moving forward. And, and, and it's just, uh, you know what, when, when you score one of those big goals and, and, and you win a game in overtime or whatever you may be doing, or maybe you make a big block to save a goal. And after everybody just comes together in a big huddle and it's just, it's just, there's no, uh, there's no better feeling than that, right? It's just great block, great block, you know, great save, great goal you know, whatever it is. And it's just at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a brotherhood to be honest. And doesn't really matter who's doing what, as long as everybody's buying in and the ultimate goal is to win a championship, which I was fortunate enough to do. You did win MVP in the 2017, in 2017 for the Kelly cup playoffs. What was it like winning that? It was honestly, it was, I didn't expect it to be honest. I mean, we had a lot of great guys that year, Alex Belzeal. Um, You know, there's a couple other names that, have gone on now have played NHL games that year and it um and and finding out I was the first defenseman to win a playoff MVP is it was extremely emotional for me it was it was so special I mean it was it was by far my greatest hockey accomplishment I'd say I mean it's just a tremendous feeling I mean and 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 then be able to share with the guys in the room after and celebrate and come together. It was, I'll, there's no better feeling for me um, I've had. And how honestly, it's one thing I'm the most proud of for sure. 
you know, your team almost won four Kelly Cups in a row, falling short to the New Finland Growlers in six games in the, I believe, 2018-19 season. What did you take away from that series? I took away from the series, I guess, it, it you know, it, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to win a championship. I mean, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to win three, and then after that series when we lose in game six and looking around the room at guys' faces and, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard because you come together for nine months. You see each other every day and, you know, it's hard and, and you're never going to play with the same team again. And um, you got to be proud of something like that, though, reaching the finals. And we, we, we held our heads up high that year. Um, you know, it's farther than Toledo's ever gone. Having gone over that hump, I beat him in, you know, in a um, – round three one year in Colorado I mean I know I know the feeling and I, I know I know it's hard and we just really took some time after that game six and reflected and and really came more close together I mean we were just we were proud and you know what but you know after that I mean you kind of got to put it behind you I mean there's nothing you can do you know you you win you lose I mean it's you either enjoy it or you you dwell on it for a while and you think about it and it's not going to change at the end of the day. And we all move forward. And, um, you know, there's a few guys back in Toledo this year, but, you know, a lot of guys moved on to bigger and better things after that and got our AHL deals and, and, and moved on. And, and, you know, that's what you want to see. I mean, you want to see guys elevate their careers and, and playing the American Hockey League and playing the NHL, I mean, that's a stepping stone, right? So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we just – we were proud that year. And, you know, we we reflected and took some time. But, you know, at the end of the day, you got to move on, and that's what we did. Your stats for those playoff runs were about point per game. Did you have a routine that you got into to make yourself comfortable during the playoffs? Honestly, no. I've never really had a routine. You know, I just try to stay loose. Um, you know, kind of – kind of the guy who wants to come to the rink, put some smiles on guys' faces, stay loose, and and just kind of remember that, hey, we're we're playing hockey for a living here in June and 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 May and, and April. I mean, we're we're here, we're playing, we might as well enjoy it. You know, I mean there's no time to you know, you're gonna lose a game. Big deal. Put it behind you, move on. You know, so you know for me I've never really been a routine guy. I just kind of go out and just enjoy the game, have fun, and make the most of it at the end of the day for me. Moving on to your time with Iowa now, you guys were poised to make a good playoff run, finishing second in the Central Division. How heartbreaking was it uh, to hear that the season had to be canceled? Well, oh, extremely. I mean, you know, we – the group of guys we had in Iowa this year, you don't see guys score 40 goals in the American Hockey League very often. You don't see – you don't see a goaltender of the year. You don't see – a guy who leads the American Hockey League in Sam Anderson points. You don't see a Jerry Mayhew in, in playing NHL games and, and, and scoring 40 goals in, in, in the American Hockey League. You don't see these things very often. And I think in Iowa, we just – we were extremely disappointed, number one, because we were chasing down Milwaukee all year and we wanted them. And it was – it sucked. I mean, it sucked because, well, you're out of hockey. What are you going to do? I mean, you know, we had a chance to make a long playoff run and you may win a Calder Cup. Who knows? Um, and, but we had an extremely close group of guys, too. I mean, we were all on the same page. We were showing up every day to work. And our staff, and Tim Army and Brett McLean and Alex Tangay and, you know, all our staff was pushing us to – for a long playoff run and we were extremely disappointed, but this year was outstanding. I mean, the relationships I built with these guys this year was just phenomenal. I mean, I talked to every single one of them every day still, and it's, I wouldn't trade that in for the world. I mean, you know, big disappointment, you know, we don't get to have a playoff run and, and prove to a lot of people, you know, we, we were going to be there and be better than Milwaukee, but we didn't get that opportunity. And, you know what? So be it. So, 
You did mention Alex Tangay, who was part of the coaching staff for Iowa. He did play, uh, you know, NHL games with the Calgary Flames. Does he ever bring, uh, you know, some of his NHL experience to the dressing room? Yeah, he's um, he, he's the guy. He's out. He's always out early in practice. He's always out. Wants to compete with the guys and make guys better. He's he, I'm geez. He could probably still play. To be honest, he's 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 still got it. I mean, he's great skater, great shot. I mean. You know, he wins a cup. He wins a Stanley Cup, right? So, I mean, it's whenever you have an opportunity to be around a guy like that, you're like a sponge. You're going to take everything in off of a kind of guy like that. And it's – there's no better feeling, too. I mean, we had other guys. We had a Cody McLeod on our team as well who was in a Western Conference final with, with, with Nashville. And, and, you know, these guys and the stories you hear from these guys, it's just – you're like a sponge. You're very interested. You always want to hear more. You always want to listen to what these guys are saying. And it was just, um, it was so awesome to hear some of the stories Tangs has from when he's played and, and, you know, playing with Cody McLeod and some of these guys too. It's funny how now he's coaching McLeod's still playing. It's just like, you know, you never know where you're going to end up. And you know what, it's um, being around a Stanley cup champion every day is, pretty awesome experience so how do you hope to remain in uh game shape for when the next ahl season starts um you know what i've been lucky that uh bufflin's got a big gym so i've been using his gym and um uh, kind of shooting pucks every day stick handling getting out on my rollerblades and just kind of staying active what i can do i mean you know obviously this is a really tough time and and health is more important right now than anything. And, and, and I would love to see everything get back to normal, but the health and safety first and foremost is, 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 is huge. And, you know, you, you want to try to stay active and do what you can, but yet you want to be able to, you want to follow the rules and, 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 um, and, and not get sick, to be honest. I mean, it's, that's what it is. I mean, you're trying to, protect yourself and protect others in the community and what you're doing and, and how you handle yourself and actions and everything. And it just took a lot of time and stayed away, but was able to stay active and, um, and still have my body feeling good. Now what's a typical game day for you? Say like you're going up against Milwaukee. Yeah. So typical game day, um, you know, you're coming in the morning, you're coming to pregame skate, you know, get loose and, 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 and whatnot. And, you're watching video on Milwaukee in the morning, kind of getting ready for them. And, and you know, they're coming in. I mean, they're, you know, the best team in American hockey league, you're coming in. So you're, there's extra motivation there for you. And um, you know what, you're coming in and I, I try to have a loose afternoon. I eat lunch, then I have a nap and, you know, come to the rink and, um, you know, play a lot of soccer and warm up and stretch. And, and once that puck drops, I mean, it's, um, there's no friends out there. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're ready to go. I mean, you want to beat these guys. You want to, you want to score goals. You want to score three, four, five. You want to run that up on them if you can. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's how it is. And I mean, um, you know what, just throughout the day, you, you always got your opponent on your mind, who you're playing, you know, what you have, who's on the other side of, um, that red line. And, and it's always in the back of your head, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you got to do, you got to do your job. Um, everybody does their job. You're going to have success in the end of the night when that horn blows after uh, the third period. And um, that's what I try to focus on most. How do you make sure that, uh, you know, the opponent doesn't get into your head too much? Cause you know, you, like you said, you do think about them, but then, you know, there's to the, there's to the point where you might overthink that. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's, you know, hockey is a big, it's a big mental side of it too. You know, you got to keep your head on, on straight, you know, it's a mental grind, you know, your body, maybe your body's not feeling good the one day, maybe, you know what, maybe you don't have it and you got to play a simple game, you know, maybe you, you got to play opposite of your strengths. You got to chip pucks out. You got to, you know, do what you can. And every day's not perfect. And, you know, you just kind of got to remind yourself that, Hey, I'm here. You know, there's a lot of people that want to be in the, this position and take your job. And, you know, at the end of the day, you got to come out and, and do your job or else somebody else will do your job for you. And you know what, that's kind of where I just kind of keep a level head and just, just kind of keep focused on the task at hand and, and, and move forward and, and, and remember to enjoy it and have fun at the end of the day. 
how busy would you say you are during the season? Well, during the season, I mean, you're at the rink three, four hours a day. I mean, you're working out, you're stretching, you're practicing, you're watching video. Um, you know, you're doing, you're, you're, you're doing everything it is to, to make you better for that next game and then next puck drop. And you're not satisfied until you feel that you did get better that day. And you know what? By the time I get home in the afternoon, it's almost take a nap. I'm that tired. I mean, you know, it takes a toll on your body. Like I said, maybe, you know, one day you're not feeling good. Maybe you don't feel good for a whole week. Who knows? That's the mental side that kicks in where you just got to keep, keep on moving forward and, and keep pushing yourself to, to get better every day. Another thing that might add to the fatigue is like the morning bag skates that I'm sure you've probably been a part of. Been part of some bag skates. Yeah, for sure. Definitely on, on, on Mondays, uh, you know, kind of playing Friday, Saturday, get a Sunday off and, and Mondays are usually pretty hard grind to practice, but uh, you know, that's where you kind of just say, all right, let's get through this one. Let's get through this one. And uh, you know, you're, by the time after practice comes on Monday, you're like, oh, I got through it. We're playing Wednesday or we're playing Friday. Like, all right, we're back into just kind of some flow tomorrow and, and get it going to Wednesday. But uh, been a part of those. I mean, they're, they're not fun where you're skating. And, uh, you know, after maybe after a Saturday night win, you're going out with the guys and having a few beers and, and hanging out. And, you know, come Monday, you're back to work and, and, and back to that hockey feeling where it's uh, – all right, I got to get better today and, and, and uh, get ready to play the next game. Now, obviously, this offseason is unlike any other. How do you keep busy during the offseason, let's say, of last year? Definitely a lot of golf for me. I think I've played probably 35 rounds already. Um, trying to stay in the gym a little bit. Um, just kind of really not a whole lot, to be honest. You know, kind of just being outside and um, – I, I, I'm, I'm still a little bit concerned about, you know, kind of going into the public areas and, and, and all that still. And, and I'm staying away from that. And um, so I just try to get home and play golf and, you know, that's four or five hours of your day right there. And then it's, you know, it's dinner time and you want to relax and, and whatnot, or you get up in the morning and work out and play golf. So just kind of really filling my days with that and um, you know, whatever else I can do or maybe get on the lake a little bit and, you know, just kind of get through the day. I mean, it's a tough time right now and society is not, it's not good. I mean, it's, you know, you want to see it get back to normal as soon as you can, but you also want to just take caution and just, you know, be safe in your own home and, and not, you know what, go out there and get the risk of maybe spreading something or something spreading to you. So, you know, just kind of, um, um, just kind of doing the right things that way. And it's, it's been great so far. In 2018, I believe you got the opportunity to do the hardest shot for the AHL. Uh, take me through the process of doing the hardest shot. For the ECHL? Yeah, ECHL, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it's, I've always had a heavy shot. So, you know, guys always, you know, want to see me do that kind of thing. And it's um, it's different. A lot of guys have different techniques. I like to skate into it a little bit. I take probably three, four strides into it. And, just kind of hammer down on one and you know what I just uh I've always been a you know being a bigger guy I mean heavier shot I mean it's something I I, I kind of thrive on too I mean it's it's you know you want to shoot the puck well you want to have a heavy shot and get pucks in the net and it's kind of one thing I work on as well is is you know having a heavy shot and it's uh it was a pretty fun opportunity competing against those other guys and seeing what they have and um yeah, I mean, it was just uh, some pretty cool experiences in that regard, you know, playing I, with playing that long and having some success and, and never playing in an all-star game. And then finally, okay, we host one. So I'm able to do some of these things. It was a pretty cool experience. It was a lot of fun. Your shot clocked in at 99 miles an hour. Was that a surprise for you? No, I'm actually, I'm usually in the, about a hundred, 101, somewhere in there. So, I mean, it was just, you know, obviously sometimes you're not going to, they're not going to come off clean or whatever, but I think I've shot one at 101 or 102, something like that, one point. So it's, uh, I was actually surprised I was in, I was, didn't get over 100, but you know what? That's life.
Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you uh, you are surprised of, you know, the score, but surprised in a different way, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, hey, it's – at the end of the day, it's all fun and games, and, and, you know, you're around those other guys around the league that you don't – you're always playing against and always want to um, drive through the glass and, and, and beat and, and, and play mean against. So it was a fun opportunity to just kind of uh, have a few laughs and, and um, kind of enjoy that experience. Have you ever been a part of a teddy bear toss game? Yeah, every uh, yeah every year I played a bunch of teddy bear toss games. A uh, lot of fun, great cause. I played in a lot of great uh, games for great causes. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. You score that goal and and all the bears rain and um, it's yeah, the things they do at these minor league levels. Um, you know, to make games fun for fans and 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 be, have them contribute and and for good, such a good cause. It's, it's, it's so awesome and great to see. What was it like having the teddy bears rain down? It's, it, it's, it's cool. I mean, it, it's cool to be uh, a part of one in your own rink compared to playing in an away rink and them having one because you're sitting there and just waiting. You're not really doing much in your home rink. You're, you know, you're, 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 you're with the fans, you know, you're scooping the bears up, you're interacting and, and whatnot. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And then, you know, having them coming with their families and kids and throwing bears on the ice and seeing the smiles on their faces. And it, it makes it that much more special. The media coverage isn't as big as it is in the AHL. Does that provide any comfort for you? Not really. I mean, it's, you know what? I, I, I always want to give back. I mean, I, it doesn't matter where I am, what league I'm playing in. I always want to give back and, and be out in the community or somebody wants to talk to me or sign something for them or see me in the parking lot and sign something for them, do whatever it may be. I always want to give back because I was, I was there at one point in my life where I looked up to a lot of these players at, at a young age. And um, I always want to give back and, and, and be involved and, and, and have people say, Hey, Matt's a great guy. He took the time to do this for me. He's, you know, he signed this for me, talked to me, took a picture with me, whatever it may be. And it's those experiences for me too. I, I, I always, it always has a big, a big, um, it's always been big for me, I guess. Um, just kind of giving back and, and my mom and dad have really been, um, you know, they want me to be that kind of person as well, not only on the ice around the rink, but away from the rink and, and around the community and be a great person and, and give back. Throughout your playing career, who would you say is the best and worst teammate to room with on a road trip? Best teammate to room with. Uh, let's see. Oh man, that's a hard one. I did room. I did room with Matt Robson this year, the goalie. Um, big snore, <laughs> talks in his sleep. You know, he's a goalie, so I'll give it a. I'll maybe give him a pass for it. But he was uh, a lot of nights. There was a lot of noise there, so <laughs> he's up there for being uh, one of the worst. Um, one of the best. Let me think about this for a sec. Probably. Oh man, that's a good question. Who did I room with in Colorado? I'm trying to think this. Best I would probably say Jake Bardo in, in Colorado. I mean, really down to earth, easy going, quiet guy. I mean, it was there was no trouble, no drama, no nothing between us, and it was always get in the room, flip on the TV, hang out, talk, eat some snacks, whatever. So I mean, it was. Um, it was great, and maybe one year or two, Brent Sopel, great guy, great teammate. Um, learned a lot from him my one year in Chicago there when I was up for – played six games, but I was up for a while and got scratched for a decent amount and was able to be around that him for a while and, and get on some trips and, and, and room with him a little bit. So, Now tell me, how the hell did you survive a room with Matt Robson who snores and talks in his sleep? Yeah, it's just – <sighs> that is brutal. 
I'd throw my AirPods in and, and <laughs> throw some on my my phone or my iPad and just kind of get through it. But you know, at goalies, you always hear goalies are kind of you know freaky animals, man. They are different. <laughs> different like, things, right? so. No, I don't want to reveal too much about you, but what would be your go-to shootout move if you were to get a chance? I'm a low blocker. Shoot low blocker. Or Nothing. I like going. Or I like going coming in. I'll go over the shoulder, glove side. Those are my two. Not not anything fancy. Not anything deacon. I do have pretty good hands. I can get in tight and make something happen. But I like to shoot the puck pretty quick. Good good release. Good quick release. Would you ever just come down and take a clapper? I've done it for fun. I haven't done it in a shootout. I've been in a few shootouts, and every shootout I've been in, I've been pretty successful, to be honest. But in practice, I sometimes get a little bit silly and, and, and take a slap shot that way. I mean, goalies. Are we good? Are you there? Yeah, I'm yeah, back. We're there. Okay, we're back. We're back. Um, you know, you know. Do you have a funny story to share about your career? Funny story about my career. Let's see. What do I got? Whether it was a team dinner on the bus, anything and everything. Well, what's pretty funny is thirty year old guy this year. The boys in Iowa make me doing some rookie duties. Some really? For rookie party stuff. Yeah, I mean. You get some guys like Matt Burkowski and Cody McLeod that uh, want to give you a little bit of backlash and, and want you to do some stuff. I did one. I did a rookie party one year in Chicago, but they were just like, well, I don't know. Since you haven't played a full year in the American League. And, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had to get up and rookie party in the dinner and tell some jokes and kind of do that stuff. So it was kind of funny. I mean, being an older guy and doing stuff like that with 20-year-olds, it was – that's probably – that's it's pretty funny stuff. I mean, you got a thirty year old guy running around doing some scavenger hunt stuff and telling team jokes and stuff. So it, it was cool. It was fun. Now, final question here: uh, Do you have any advice for aspiring hockey players that may look up to you one day? Yeah, I would say just you, you know what, never give up. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's um, it comes down. A lot of kids come down to the choice. Well, you know, do I want to play hockey? Do I? Well, I got to make that decision and. I would just say, you know what, do whatever feels right in your heart. I mean, if you want to play hockey, do it I mean, and, and give it everything you got every day and, and listen to the people around you. I mean, there's a lot of great people out there with, you know, a lot of great stories and, and teaching tips and, and, and are always willing to help. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it's just – it's a fun game to be a part of around the community and the relationships and people you meet. It's, it's, it's a forever type thing. So, um, you know what, at the end of the day, just – you know what, play hard, give it all you have and, and be a good person. I mean, you know what, that's half the battle, you know, coming in and being a great player, a great team guy. And, you know, at the end of the day, just kind of follow your heart and, you know, everything will fall into place. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Iowa Wild defenseman Matt Register for joining me on today's podcast. Thank you again, Matt. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it.